the tools to create your own unique masterpieces. Good evening, everyone. I am your Hello, hello, everyone. Should be kicking off here in just a moment. Nine o'clock. Nine o'clock is fine. Uh, yep. <laughs> do, I, do I need do I need a shave? Is that what you said? I need to shave. <laughs> so evidently, you guys can see my stream. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, hey Brian, how you doing? Um, we're going to uh, kick off with uh, and answer just a couple of quick questions that were kind of posed today, and then we're going to jump right into the. Vetric software. Okay, we're gonna jump right into the Vetric VCarve software. So, um, we're just uh, coming in, streaming here, and make sure that uh, <clears throat> everything is uh, up and running. All right. So let's see here. Oh my, oh my, oh my. So, Wayne Hineker, let me know if you can hear me, Wayne. Uh, Brian, you might have lost the feed for just a moment. We shouldn't have lost it completely. No, we're still alive, Brian. Uh, let me know if all right let me know if you lost the feed we'll see how How everything is going. Okay, everything is good. Running okay. Good sound and picture. All right. All right. So, Wayne, um, listen, uh, quick thing. Uh, hold on one second. I, gotta, I, I forgot the guy's name. Hold on one second, Wayne. Hey, Wayne, did, uh, Dick Karen uh, called today, said he received a package uh, that he wasn't a Digital Wood Carver customer and didn't order anything from Digital Wood Carver. Um, and uh, uh, that was uh, sent to the address that you gave. So make let me know if you know Dick Karen or his wife or something. Uh, let, get, reach out to them at some point. No, no, it's not the first standby. There is no standby. Uh, you guys, uh, are you getting good picture and feed and everything? Because all I get, all I see right now, currently, is a um, just a preview screen of the Spindle TV logo. Let me know if you guys are getting the feed.
All right, so you're getting the feed. Okay, great. Hey, Sandra. Um, welcome, everyone. All right, so normally uh, while I'm watching, I'm kind of uh, watching the preview as well. And the uh, all good in Ohio. Thank you, David. Um, usually I'm watching the stream and on. Right now I don't have a stream. and then So that's why I keep asking you guys if you're good. All right. So, uh, yeah, Wayne, just uh, make sure you reach out to the guys and girls over there where we sh sent that shipment to. Your touch plate has arrived to them, but they didn't know what it was or why they were getting a package. <laughs> so just make sure you get that, uh, you know, that information. All right. Oh, I'm sorry, Gary. Uh, uh, sorry about that, Gary. I didn't realize um, that uh, uh, that was in there. Um, that reminds me, I also got to approve someone else that has uh, that's on a different account. Okay, now, one of the things uh, that uh, came up today was that uh, when updating to the, the TNG, that the controller wasn't working, right? The handheld controller. And because in the setting file that I created... Uh, for you guys I forgot to set the controller pin so we're gonna take a quick second to show you that just so you know how to set the controller pin so your controller will work alright so uh, and then after that uh, we're gonna jump into the Vetric and, and and we're gonna make some stuff we're gonna show you guys all the tools and everything and to get you orientated I want to thank you for sticking with me last night I know it was a bit rough uh, but you know we have uh, customers that are using the CNC USB controller we have customers that are using the uh, TNG you know they got it with their machine and stuff and we also have customers that are migrating over uh, you know that they've been around for a while and they're migrating over to TNG because TNG stands for the next generation it's the newest uh, version of the Vetric software and um, if any of you uh, customers that are new and you're you've got CNC USB controller with your machine and you'd like to migrate over uh, let me know and uh, you know we can do that but you know um, it's uh, it's not like a must you know it's not like mandatory or anything like that but you know we had a customer uh, today that said hey you know so we're all you know on the same page um, you know uh, should I move over and yeah you know it uh, but you don't have to because I'm gonna be teaching in the CNC USB controller I'm going to be talking about the TNG which is you know the newest version of the CNC controller and I'm also when I do training I train it with regards to desktop pro and aspire um, but don't um, you know don't let what you see confuse you or anything uh, because uh, last night probably should have done uh, like a TNG introduction and then later on or something a, a USB CNC how to install uh, and then a Vetric like tonight we're doing the just the Vetric but I because we have new customers that just bought their machines that they have they either came with the CNC USB controller or they came with the TNG uh, they're they're waiting to be able to connect their machines and get up and running so I was covering both um, and uh, it probably got a little convoluted little you know uh, uh, um, confusing and stuff but if there's any confusion just let me know shoot you know shoot a message in Facebook uh, you guys comment in Facebook on that message whatever uh, you know in the Facebook group you know put a post and I will do my best to change um, you know everything uh, that we can do okay all right so real quick let's go ahead and switch over to the uh, screen here
Stand by. You're going to get sound here. <clears throat> All right. Let me know when you have sound again, and we'll continue because I just had a uh, whole speech there. Um, what I was saying is uh, when you guys see my TNG pop up on the screen, let me know. That was about the time that we lost sound because I forgot to set the microphone for that screen. Um, and uh, so let's see if um, you guys get... Did I hit the wrong button? Sound is back. Sound is back. Blame the dog. <laughs> All right. Well, what I was saying was I switched over to uh, the TNG screen and I didn't have the microphone programmed in for that screen uh, in my producer. So, uh, no, not yet. <laughs> um, so, what I was saying was... Um, you guys and girls, uh, you know, that, that are new and all, we have new users and stuff, and it's a whole new technology. It, it's, it's, it's something that it's never been done before. And all of a sudden now, uh, you know, you're getting these instructions and you're seeing CNC USB. You're seeing Planet CNC. You're seeing all these things and going, holy shit, uh, you know, can I do this? Yes, you can. Um, it simply is uh, we happen to be at a time you haven't hit at a time that we're in the show season. Uh, and we're selling a lot of shows and getting a lot of new customers, which is wonderful. But it's also at the same time that TNG has been released. And uh, Planet CNC, TNG motion controller software, the update to the CNC USB motion controller software. And it hit right at the same time. So we have people migrating over we have people that uh, they got the TNG with their machine. We've got people that, you know, they just got their machine with the USB CNC controller going, wait a minute, do I update? Do I not update? Do I change over? And, and things. So it's kind of like, you know, it's it, there's a little bit of, uh, you know, confusion and it's understandable. Um, if you just got your machine and it came with the CNC USB controller, Planet CNC TNG is the upgrade. It's a free upgrade. Uh, it's the upgrade to the CNC USB controller. And you can absolutely migrate over if you would like to, but you don't have to. Uh, but you could it's because we, it's always a good idea to keep your software up to date. Now, um, so bear with us, you know, bear with me. Um, uh, I know there's, there's times of frustration because, of course, yeah, you just spend a lot of money. You want to get your machine up and running and making sawdust and some cool stuff. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, you're waiting for that orientation which is kind of what we're trying to cover here as a group to get you guys started on the right foot um, and um, you know so just bear with us bear with me because uh, it, you know it'll start to level out and get back to normal and then of course show season uh, for me ends around March the end of March and everything and then I go back to being dedicated to you guys 24-7 uh, doing everything I can to be there for you when you need me it's just during the show season. It's a little bit. It gets a little bit. The, the schedule gets a little bit tighter. Uh, so if you can, you know, uh, uh, be understanding uh, and um, be, um, be, uh, you know, just just know that I will. We will get with you. I will get with you as quickly as possible to get you up and running. But hopefully, some of these tutorials will help you initiate and get running your you know you know get thing get the ball rolling yourself and stuff and so we're gonna you know but we're we're dedicated to the customers we're dedicated to you guys uh, i'm totally dedicated my whole life revolves around digital wood carver and um you know uh and, and all of this so um you know just uh have a little patience with me and my staff because i do have a new young lady named denise dyson uh, you guys uh, may be talking to her from time to time when you call. If I'm on the other line, she'll be answering from now on so you don't get some voice message or something. You'll be able to kind of uh, let someone know, hey, I'm trying to reach Laney kind of thing. So Denise will be in the offices each day. And I just brought her on, so she's in training. So be, be, be patient with her as well. Um, and uh, we'll make sure everything uh, smooths out. Uh, Wayne Henniker, excellent question. Yes, you need to be hooked up to the digital wood carver machine when you're updating. Now, here's the key thing, okay? Here's the very, very key thing. Now, for you new customers uh, that just got your machine with the CNC USB controller, what I'm about to say does not apply to you, okay? 
for you customers that have Planet CNC and you want to migrate over, the first thing, the absolute first thing you do is you must, must update your CNC USB controller software to the latest version. You go to planet-cnc.com. You download the latest version of the CNC USB controller, the 2.10171010 uh, long number, but you must update. You update your software and you update your firmware. Once you do that, now the driver, the firmware, and everything in your CNC USB controller is up to date, and it makes migrating over much easier because everything connects. If you're not up to date is where we run into uh, hangups and glitches and hitches and stuff. Okay, so you must update planet-cnc.com. Go to their products menu. And here, let me show you on the screen just for a quick moment. Let's pull this screen over here. We want to go to planet-cnc.com. And again, this is for individuals that uh, have had the CNC USB controller for some time. You new customers that have the CNC USB controller, you already have the latest version. So this does not apply. Uh, products, software. When you click on software, it'll take you to the software page and it's going to say choose your download. You want to choose the CNC USB controller V2.10.1710.2601. You want to download that and you want to install it. Okay, that will bring your CNC USB controller up to the latest version. It'll update your firmware. Once you do that, now the migration over to the Planet CNC TNG software will be much smoother. Okay? For you ladies and gentlemen that have the CNC USB controller with your machine, you just got your machine and everything, you already have a, yes, uh, I believe she does, uh, Rick. You already have a uh, the latest version. So migrating over to the Planet, C T Planet CNC TNG software uh, is, is not going to be difficult at all. And for those of you that have the Planet CNC TNG software that came with your machine, uh, mostly the last week and a half, two weeks, most of all the new machines within that had it, um, you already have the TNG software. So you, none of this applies to you except for the TNG stuff. Okay. Now, many of you have updated to the TNG software, and all of a sudden when you updated your controller, uh, the controller will be uh, like not working you know it's like well wait a minute my controller's not working now well all it is is it's very simple that the pins in the setting files were not set okay so here are the steps you're gonna go to file you're gonna come down to settings the settings box is gonna open up you're gonna come down and you're going to look at shortcuts right under the user interface menu shortcuts in the shortcuts, you're going to scroll all the way down until you get to the jog pins, which you will see here. It'll say jog in black letters over in the action column. Your jog pins, because your pendant is not working, the jog pins are not set. These, these boxes in the pin section are blank. So for the X minus, you're going to set the jog pin to jog 2. X plus jog one, Y minus jog four, Y plus jog three, Z minus jog six, and Z plus jog five. So if you notice a pattern, two, one, four, three, six, five. Once you set those pins, you will click OK, and your pendant will start working again. Okay? Two one four three six five on the jog pins. Alright? And your pin that will start working again. Now, another question we got was, you know, how do you control the jog speed uh, with TNG? Well, one is your handheld control pin. And now you can actually control the speed while you're moving with that handheld control pin at the turn dial. 
if you need to adjust the jog speed in the TNG software at the very bottom here, this 150 is the jog box, okay? This 150 is the jog box. Double click on that jog box and you can enter in your speed, what you wanna slow it down to and hit enter, okay? So if you are manually setting your jog speed in the TNG software, double click on the number, enter in the speed and hit enter. Okay, all right. Now, Brian, uh, thank you if you have to leave off. Uh, that's, um, uh, you know, uh, let me know uh, how things go. Brian, before you leave off real quick, uh, in your software, real quick for Brian Kazera, in your settings under colors, if you scroll down on your colors, you will see these G code colors. Your F speeds, your F words, your F35, F24, and all of that stuff, they're set to red. Red is not a dangerous color <laughs> in the software. That just happens to be the color that those codes are set to in your G code. If you would like to adjust the color, you absolutely can by clicking on the star and changing the color. All right? So just uh, that's why those F speeds were red because that's what the color was set for when that G code loads in here. All your G words are orange, your M words are baby blue, all the X axis and everything, uh, they're blue, dark blue, and then our F words were red. All right? So just keep that in mind. You have control. You can change the colors of anything in your software you know, uh, line numbers, anything like that, you can change those custom colors. Now, if you do change any settings, such as the pins in your controller, be sure to go to File, Export Settings, and export those new settings. And if you want to, you can very simply either overwrite your old setting file by clicking on it and clicking Save. It'll ask if you want to replace it or you can create a new setting file. And normally if I create a new setting file for myself, uh, DWC TNG, I will put the date that I changed that setting. So 2-21-18. And let's put another little underscore in front of that. Uh, and then I would click save and that will update and save that setting file. Now a good idea uh, for me, what I always do when I do save a new, when I export and save a completely new setting file, I just very simply come in here to File Import Settings, and I actually click on that setting and just click Open, just to make sure the software is pointing to that new file when I open it the next time. All right. So hopefully, that will clear up a couple of the small questions that you guys have, um, and. Uh, uh, you know in the TNG now now we're gonna move over to the Vetrix software and we're gonna get this to this part of the training started I just want to cover wanted to cover those two very simple things Okay, so we're gonna close out of this and we're in our Vetrix software now I covered a little bit in the beginning last night because it but it was late and there was we've been we've been we were going for two hours and stuff So I'm gonna kind of recap the Vetrix software the first thing is when you open your Vetrix software, if there's any updates, minor updates and everything, you're gonna see those up here in the top corner of your Vetrix software, version 9.015 is available. If you click on that, you're gonna get a black screen for a moment. It will open up the wizard to run that install. Now, once we install, the software it's going to say that the application needs to be closed. What that means is close your Vetrix software and then click OK so it can finish running that install setup. Now what will happen in a few minutes or a few seconds um, when it finishes the download, uh, you're going to get the patch wizard is going to pop up on the screen. And so as it pops up on the screen, I'm gonna fill the dead space with my banter. <laughs> and I'm gonna go back and uh, um, the, 
uh, while this is uh, loading uh, pop up there for me let me make sure that's not it that's not it don't get impatient with it it takes a second uh, but let's see here we've got um, uh, Rick Falk yes she likes Dr. Pepper from what I understand here's our wizard finishing its own download uh, Baron Lynn is absolutely correct. That is a must because I need someone to do Dr. Pepper runs every once in a while. Um, so how do you check what program you already have? Wayne, that's a very good question. In the CNC USB controller, just simply click on the help menu. Go down to the about. It's the last option in the help menu. And when it opens up, it'll show you the version of your software. So we're going to go ahead and click next. And we're going to let it run this patch real quick. Now, uh, if you click on the help, it'll show you the version. Click on that version, it'll go away. That window will go away. Uh, Brian, have a great night. And uh, the, uh, let's see here. Dead on my shotgun. <laughs> All right, Brian. Uh, Dennis, I've had a wonderful day. It's been a busy day. And if any of you are in the chat room or in the in this chat that have tried to call me today and I didn't get a chance to get back to you, I deeply apologize. Um, it's it's been a very long day, and uh, but I will um, uh, reach out with you tomorrow. Uh, if any of you have texted me or messaged me, um, I will be answering those texts tonight. So I apologize for the late evening replies. I'll try not to text too late. Now once that patch is finished downloading, we're going to click start and it's going to take a second and run that patch. Okay. Now, um, but yes, all in all, it's been a wonderful day and having missed Denise, <coughs> she used to work for me uh, when I worked for uh, a company, uh, a track saw company a while back and um, she, uh, she was my admin. Uh, I brought her on board here because um, I needed someone in the office to help me uh, keep up with uh, you guys and the demand. You know, when I, I don't, I know that a lot of you are waiting or have waited for things and stuff, and hopefully, we can start streamlining a little bit better. I am training someone in the software training side to help with uh, trainings and stuff. Miss Denise will not be helping with training, so. Uh, you won't get to uh, look at her smiling face during classes. You still got to look at me uh, until we get uh, another trainer. And I promise next time I will be shaved uh, and clean. So now that the, the software has patched and it's updated, we're going to simply open it back up. And the first thing <clears throat> that it should tell you is that you were successfully updated to 9.015. Uh, and uh, it asks you, it tells you to click OK. Now, when you click OK, it's going to open up the release notes showing you what was fixed in that particular update. I personally don't review the release notes, but you can. So we are successfully updated. Click OK to review the release notes. So when I do that, it's going to open up a web browser showing me the release notes and um, the. Uh, um, and then we're done. We're, we're all up to date. Okay, 9.015. All right, in your Vetric software, whether it's desktop, pro, or Aspire, we're going to be setting up the job. We're going to be creating a new file. Now we can also ex open existing files, uh, you know, that we've worked on and everything or that we have, but also the recently opened files, files that I've been um, working on in the past, uh, those would be uh, here. <clears throat> in the uh, recently opened files. Now for any of you new users, you have a wonderful link right here uh, called Video Tutorials, uh, Tutorial Video Browser. Now if you click that link, that link will take you straight to the training library where you have wonderful step-by-step -step tutorial videos. Now the awesome thing about these tutorial videos is not only do they provide you with the step-by-step -step video broken down into you know sections and things, but they also provide you with the files of the project they're working on in the video. 
Uh, that way you can download those files and open them up in your software and work with that video step by step. It's awesome. It's a great way to learn all the ins and outs of this software. Now in that library to kind of show you how they kind of do things when it comes to the vector drawing our category here vector drawing. These are all about vectors. Well, if we look at the uh, child's name plaque here, the Molly plaque, I call it. This video shows how to plan and organize and draw and edit your vectors. Uh, you know, when you have, uh, you know, tool paths where pieces are being fit together. Now, that's the drawing part of it. Well, if we scroll down to the tool paths library, and we scroll down, we will see the child's name plaque project again. And here, this video shows how to create the tool pass to cut the two parts that we created when we drew them out in the previous video. So it's phenomenal, phenomenal stuff. They, you know, they, they break it down very, very nicely for you. Um, I could probably take lessons on this and uh, how to break down my videos so they're not so confusing. Um, the uh, Vetric Library is 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 a wealth of knowledge. Okay, so and again, we can access that by view visiting uh, the tutorial video browser here in the beginning of the software, or we can also visit that by clicking on Help, visit Vetric Support Online. When that support page opens click on training or don't don't click on training just hover over training and when it when that menu drops down choose your software and it will take you in to the training library so there's two ways that we can access that library all right okay now uh, pause for the cause for a moment uh, glad you can help uh, to reset the offset in TNG do you just double click uh, and set to zero Jimmy that's a great question I'll get back to that uh, in just a little bit we'll, we'll do that in the Q&A at the end of the class okay so hang tight with me and we'll when we get through the vetric we will come back and answer that uh, Baron excellent question how are the past classes coming along um, to be out there as well and so the uh, past classes if you'll bear with me I'm not going to say it. I don't want you guys having to take shots. <clears throat> the past classes <clears throat> are all here. So we've got classes like creating a quarter board, decorative font, porch board, and everything. Uh, these, uh, because our WebEx account is closed down, uh, all of these uh, videos have been uh, the class videos have been downloaded they're they're ARF files so they're all being converted over to uh, the mp4s and they're being uploaded uh, those we that channel that might have my main priority is to start populating that channel with these past classes uh, as uh, quickly as possible and I happen to be off from the shows this week to be able to work with everybody and one of my goals is to get these videos up okay so we've got some cool good live feed streams on different things and those will soon very very soon be on the channel now I know you guys have been hearing that and everything but uh, we, we, we got the first step we got the videos you know these two and three hour videos these long sessions uh, we've got all of them uh, down and they started to be converted from ARFs to you know the MP4 so they can be uploaded and uh, they will soon be available all right okay so back to what we were doing now so in the Vetric software uh, we want to create a new file now we're going to set up a single-sided job and, and last night if you were with me we talked about the single-sided job and the double-sided job we're going to set up a single-sided job tonight and we're going to set a width of 20 inches and we're going to set a height of nine and a quarter we're going to set a thickness of three quarters 
Now, to recap on these entry boxes, you can do math in these entry boxes. For instance, if I said 20 divided by 2 and hit the equal sign on my keyboard, you know, it changed that to 10. Add, subtract, multiply, divide, we can do in these boxes. If we need to know, if we don't know the exact fraction or decimal for a particular fraction, we can type in that fraction and hit in the equal sign on our keyboard and it'll put the appropriate decimal in. Um, the Baron, that is actual, that's, that's an actual file. I can send that to you. That's a file, not a video, but yeah, I can send that to you. Um, so you can do the fraction to decimal conversion. All right. Now, one of the things you guys and girls that have a fourth axis, if you've got a fourth axis with your machine, when we're creating a fourth axis project, we have to know the circumference of that cylinder. When we wrap that cylinder, you know, or we, when we have our cylinder, our, our diameter of our part, we have to basically unwrap it like a flat sheet because we draw in a flat plane in our drawing software. So we, know, we need to know the circumference. And normally we would multiply the diameter, let's say if I had a four inch diameter piece, I would multiply that by pi, 3.14, and hit equal to get the circumference. Well, we can also use the equation four times p for pi, and hit the equal sign and get that circumference, okay? So your diameter times P equal signs will give you the circumference of that part, okay? And so that's where the math comes in handy in these entry boxes. All right, now when we're touching off our machine Z0 position, we can either touch off on the surface of our material, the top of our board that we're carving or whatever it is, or we can touch off on the bottom, which would be a representation of touching off on our tabletop or our waste board. And so uh, nine times out of 10, we're referencing off the top of the surface. What would be one reason we reference off the bottom? Well, if this piece of wood is kind of rough sawn, you know, it's not really flat and things, then we wouldn't want to touch off on the top because we could be touching off on a high spot or a low spot. We're not getting a good reading. So we would reference off the bottom of the material, which would be our flat tabletop or our waste board. We need a flat surface to reference off of. I'm going to work off the material surface. I'm going to work with a nice plain board here. And the last thing I have to set up is my X, Y datum position. My X, Y, zero. My X, Y, home position. X, Y datum position is just a fancy way of saying our starting position. Where's our X, Y, zero? Where's our X, Y, home? Which is all the same thing. X, Y, zero, X, Y, home is the same thing, just different terminology. Now we can reference and work and start off the center of our board or any of the four corners okay I'm gonna work off the center for this project <clears throat> now the modeling resolution we do have a 2d view and we have a 3d view and on that 3d view it's blank right now because we're not looking at a toolpath and we're not looking at a 3d model but we can make that 3d view look like anything that we want it to look like we can change the colors we can change the wood type we can change you know, we can use solid colors if we want. We can make it look like steel, whatever the case may be. Um, but the resolution, the quality of this view, of this screen, when we are in a, for default, it sets it as a standard quality, which is about 1 million points or 1 million pixels. Now, the... Uh, higher we go the more pixels we get and the better the resolution is on this 3d view in its highest view we get about a 98 percent representation of what the project will look like when it's carved so accurate that we can see tool marks and things in the preview and stuff and it's a very nice setting now notice the seven times slower 
That does not mean that if you have this set to very high that the project runs or carves seven times slower. It means when you're previewing the tool path and seeing the cut in this preview screen, it is processing <clears throat> seven times slower because there's a lot of pixels that it's working with, okay? If you need it to process fast, you wanna see what it's gonna look like, you don't care about the quality in this view, then come over and set it to standard, okay? I like the very high because I like to see what I'm getting. All right, so single-sided job, 20 by eight and a quarter, three quarter uh, inch thick. We're gonna touch off on the material Z top and we're gonna start in the center for our start position, whole X, Y, datum position. We're gonna click OK, and that's gonna bring us into our drawing tab. Now, in the drawing tab, uh, if we look down below, we've got four tabs, drawing, modeling, clip art, and layers, okay? Now, in the drawing tab is where you're spending about 90% of your time. Um, and the uh, main menus of the drawing tab are in black print. File operations, create vectors, transform objects, edit objects, and offset and layout. Now, if you ever call me and we go over something together in the phone, I'm gonna usually say something like, you know, click on the second icon or the first icon on the second row in your create vectors menu. And that's what I'm referring to, the create vectors menu, first icon, second row, you know? So I'm, I'm referring to those menus and they're in black print. Now, the Wayne, how do you toggle between the 2D and 3D split screen? That's a great question. So in our views here, our file operations, create vectors, transform objects, edit objects, and offset and layout, we also have what's called a 2D view bar, and that runs across the screen. So on the top of the screen, this is where we can actually see our layers, and we can access them there. We can also access them from the Layers tab down below over here. Over here, we can turn on our Smart Snapping for geometry snapping and things. We can turn on a grid if we need a grid to snap to. Now, when that grid is on, You've got all these little grid dots. Well, those grid dots are default set to a quarter inch apart. If we want to adjust the grid, we go over to edit, snap options, and we can adjust the grid spacing here, okay? Now, notice that edit snap options, the shortcut for that is F4. Meaning if I'm on my screen and I need to adjust my tabs rather than going over to this menu, I could simply hit F4 on my screen and that screen will pop up for me. Okay, so that's shortcut. There are a lot of shortcut keys and uh, you know combinations and things to get uh, the software to do many things. And those shortcuts the keyboard shortcuts can be found under the help menu. And in the help menu, when those keyboard shortcuts open up, you have a menu up here and you can go to the menu and it will show you those shortcuts. Okay. H for horizontal, V for vertical. Uh, what happens when we push the H by itself or control H or shift H or both of the shift and control and H. So these shortcuts, you know, you have those combinations and things, and that's the, you know, the shortcut keys. And this can be printed out too as like a little cheat sheet for you. All right, now along our view bar, other than the grid, we have the 2D view here. Our pan view is this little cross, uh, you know, of arrows, meaning we can pan our view around. Our Zoom box means we're going to use our mouse to draw a box around something. So if I had something on the screen here, an item, and I needed to zoom into a part of it or all of it, I would I could use the zoom box. And now if I hold down my left mouse button, I can draw a zoom window and it will zoom in to that item. You know? 
The middle magnifying glass is zoom to the drawing limits. It's basically a zoom to fit. If we click that, it brings our whole board back into full screen view. Now, if we have an object or objects selected on our screen, when it's selected, it's pink. It's either going to be a pink dotted line or a pink solid line. And if we need to zoom into a selected object or objects, we have this magnifying glass with the little pink box around it, just like that pink dotted line. And we can click on that. That is zoom to the active or selected objects. So if I click on that, that will zoom in to that object. Now, Wayne, be patient. We're two windows away from your, uh, your, your question about how do you toggle or switch or do a split screen. But I want to talk about these two items here. These items come in very, very handy. So let's say that I have a rectangle here. And let's say that I create a profile toolpath on this and that I'm cutting uh, you know, through my material. And I want to be on the inside of that line you know, when I'm cutting. And I go ahead and I hit calculate. Now, when that, uh, when that calculates, it'll automatically bring you into the 2D view. Now, for you guys and girls that have desktop, it does not automatically open you up to the 3D view. You would just simply close that toolpath and you would come into the preview icon here and open up. Now, if you want to automatically be brought into the 3D view, you go to edit options or edit options, yes, down here. And in the options, you will scroll down and you'll see an option that says auto open 3D view. You want to make sure that says yes then it will automatically open you into the 3D view when you calculate a toolpath. So now in the 3D view, if we look at our toolpath, we can see our toolpath lines, but let's venture back over to the 2D view and let's see what we have. So I'm gonna zoom in to that selected item. You can see these arrows here. These arrows are indicating which direction and where my router bit is traveling. This is the wire frame view of the toolpath. Now, I can turn the uh, toggle, the Toolpath 2D draw visibility. I can, I can have that off to where it doesn't show me that toolpath in the 2D view. That's that little light bulb on and off. Now, the next icon is toggling between the wireframe and the solid view. So right now, with my quarter inch router bit that I has, uh, had programmed for this profile cut, I can't really tell what it's doing here you know I see the wireframe I see the direction but I want to see what this cut kind of looks like you know on my part so if I click on the solid view now we have a solid view of the router bit and notice here that I've got a square rectangle and now I can see in my solid view because of the radius of the router bit the inside corners of my rectangle are going to be rounded because that router bit can't get in and do sharp corners on internal corners you know, so this is a solid view. Well, let's say that, you know, I'm cutting right on the inside of the line, but let's say I want to overlap and do a little bit of an offset cut. I want it to cut in or on the outside of this part. Well, if I come in here into my 2D toolpath, my allowance offset, set, let's say if I go, I want to go negative uh, an eighth of an inch. And I calculate that toolpath. Well, in that 2D view, now you can see that I've overlapped my line. I am offset beyond my boundary line an eighth of an inch. If I were to have set this to a positive number and calculated that toolpath, then in the 2D view, I'd be offset away from my line that eighth of an inch. If I have no offset, then my router bit is going to be cutting right on the line. Okay, so these two tabs here are your uh, visibility. We can turn that on and off, but also our wireframe solid view of the toolpath of what it's cutting. So that quarter inch router bit is going to cut all this material away. So I'm going to end up with a block 
in the middle of my cut and then I'm gonna have that rectangle so if we actually previewed this cut in the 3d view you would see that I've got this block my router bit cut that part out and I do have those radius corners because of my router bit now if you ever double click on a waste piece it will remove that waste piece if you double click on your project board you're gonna get a warning saying hey deleting this is gonna delete all the material you sure you want to do that you know uh, when it, as far as delete the view you know you're gonna get that warning so it's letting you know that your project is about to be if you accidentally click on this instead of your part that you want to actually delete it'll say hey wait a minute you know it's gonna remove everything all right now Wayne asked a very good question how do I tile between the 2d view and the 3d view because I might be working with a 3d model well let's for for dramatic effect let's bring a 3d model into the software and let's actually grab it out of our clip art all right in our 2d view our model looks like a grayscale image in our 3d view we can actually see the 3d model now we can work with these windows side by side by clicking this button here so that as we work in the 2d view you can see the live update in the 3d view as we work in the 3d view because we can work in both windows you'll see it update in the 2d view so we can actually work in both windows all right and so we can toggle those windows side by side we can also tile those windows one on top of the other if i move that fast enough it looks like he's galloping okay all right so you know we can tile those now to get out of the tiled view and go back to a single screen you simply maximize you maximize the 2d view from there you click on that zoom to fit or zoom to drawing limits whatever you want to call it and it will pull your board back into full screen view all right <clears throat> Brian that's a very good question um, and uh, let me let me interrupt so Brian asked when he's calculating his toolpath and when he's running in his software we get a button that pops up that says m6 tool change not specified well m6 is a tool changer an automatic tool changer the automatic tool changer is uh, not you don't have one on your digital wood carver you are the tool changer you change the bits so the software is simply saying hey this is not configured you could click OK and move forward it'll start your carving after you click OK but if you want to remove if you want to remove to where that box doesn't pop up anymore then you need to come over to the drawing side of your software and go to file open application data folder you need to go into the post processor you need to scroll down to your digital wood carver inch post processor and it'll say DWC G code inch it won't say digital wood carver DWC so if we open up that post processor it'll ask what file what program you want to open it up in you open it in notepad this is the post processor this is all the code that makes that G code happen when you create it now if we come right up here to the beginning header of the post processor we can remove the T1 M6 code okay we can remove the t1m6 code because that is the code that triggers that m6 tool change not configured alert that you get if we delete that 
and we save that file the next time we calculate a toolpath with our digital woodcarver inch post processor that T1M6 will not be at the top of the G code and you will not get that trigger saying that the M6 tool change is not configured okay all right now the uh, and you guys you know don't be afraid uh, you know the the post processors and things you don't want to go changing them crazy because then your machine's gonna act all nuts but simple things like that the headers and the footers and all hell you could write in that header uh, you know um, Brian is the man and every time you open a toolpath on your toolpath on the right side, it's going to say Brian is the man. T1M6, blah, 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 all the way down. You know what I mean? Uh, so, um, you, know, you, can, you know, you can add stuff to those headers and footers. You know, just little notes or whatever you want. Uh, make sure they're in quotes. Uh, you know, quote marks and stuff. All right. So, that, that tiled view, that's, that's our, so this is our view bar, guys and girls. This is our view bar up here. So we've got our 2D view, our 3D view. We've got our layers that we can drop down and add layers and change. We've got our snapping options. We've got our grid. We've got our 2D view toggle and zooms. Our wireframe and solids. And then our window tiling, you know. So that's our view bar. Now, under the file operations here, everything to do with a file, right? Creating a new file opening an existing file, saving the current file you're working on, importing vectors from your computer, importing a vector file from your computer into the Vetric software. Now those Vetric files, they're going to have extensions like a DXF file, a DWG, EPS, an AI, a PDF, PVC is uh, Photo VCarve. That's the file extension for that Vetric Photo VCarve. So you can actually import that into your Vetric software. V3D, V3M, CRV, SketchUp, and SVG. So the, the PVC, the V3M, the V3D, and the CRV, those are all Vetric file formats. Vectric, not vector, Vetric. They're vectors, but that's Vetric file format. Okay, the actual software. Now we can also import pictures, import bitmaps for tracing. Notice how it says for tracing. Whenever we import a picture, like a JPEG, a bitmap, a GIF, TIFF, PNG, or JPEG, whenever we import those type of images into our software, those are pixeled images and they have to be traced. Okay, they have to be traced, and you don't trace it, the software does. So, let's see if I have any. I've moved a lot of stuff here lately. My favorite one, uh, as of date, I love this carving, it looks really cool. Uh, let me delete the horse. So, this is a JPEG picture. Okay, we just brought in. JPEG, PNG, bitmap, GIF, TIFF. This happens to be a JPEG. Now, this is a uh, how I found this. I mean, very cool design. It looks awesome when it's carved, too. Um, but this is a henna drawing. You know, like henna tattoos. You know, those washable tattoos. This is henna art. So, you can Google search henna art and find some pretty awesome patterns. Now, when we bring an image in, notice we imported that bitmap for tracing. That means we have to trace the, the, this image. Now, of course, if you literally had to go in there and trace that entire image yourself, you'd be like, screw this, I'm gone. <laughs> you don't trace it. The software does, all right? The software has under the Create Vectors menu, that's where we're actually drawing shapes and lines and text and things. It has a trace bitmap tool. And this tool fits those vector lines to the selected bitmap image. So when I open up that trace bitmap tool, notice that it fades the image out a little bit. So what we want to do is the first thing we want to do is we want to turn the bitmap fading. We want to slide that over to none so we can see our image in its full glory. 
Now, in the bitmap tracing, we have two options for tracing. We have a color trace and a black and white trace. Now, the color trace does not mean my photo is color or black and white. My photo, the color trace simply means this. It's going to look at every color in this photo and 16 of the main colors it's going to lay out in swatches. Now, if I want to narrow that down, notice how as I slid down, all of the watermarks and everything went away. Like if I'm in the full 16, it's showing me all the watermarks and all those grays and everything. And so if I click on my you know, boxes here and start filling them in, I can make those watermarks disappear and stuff. But rather than do that to help me get started, if I slide this over and let's look at our image in its full glory here. Let me zoom in and front and center. All right. As I slide this bar over, you will see those colors start to disappear. Okay. You'll see all those grays and shades and everything disappear. Now I have two colors to choose from. My trace color is red. I can make it whatever color I want. If I happen to be working with a picture with red in it, then I would not have a trace color of red. It'd be blue or something contrasting. My trace color is red, meaning when I check off the black box, all the black areas are going to get filled with red. My lines that get drawn are going to get drawn around this trace color. Okay. So if I come down here and I'll click on my default corner fit and my default noise and I'll click preview and it will trace the image. Now if that bitmap fading, if it faded, turn the fading off and we can see it in its full glory, what would happen if I faded it to full? Then it's going to hide the image and I'm just going to see a good outline of my tracing of those vector lines that were drawn. You know? So I can fade my actual image in and out. Now coming back up, and I'm going to undo this. Control Z is a shortcut code for undo. But coming back out, let's talk about corner fit and noise filter. Now this is a good high quality image. There's not a lot of pixelation and things. There's not a lot of noise. But if I was working with a low resolution where there was a lot of noise and pixelation like this little booger sticking out right here, you know, I could say, okay, let's filter out some of that noise so the lines don't get drawn around it. Now the default noise filter is two pixels. The minimum I can go is one pixels and the maximum is 10 pixels. So anything in this image that is 10 pixels or less the software will ignore it when it's drawing the trace lines. So let's see if I come over here and look at this little pixel sticking out here. Let's see if on my noise filter, my highest setting, if I trace this, if it ignores it. It does. Okay. Now let's undo that and let's see if this happen if this pixel right here happens to be more than one, you know. So let's Let's bring this all the way down to the minimum and let's preview that again. So it still ignored it. So this pixel is less than one pixel. This, there's, there's multiples in here. So it's, it's kind of an insignificant you know, drawing. It's ignoring it. But there's going to be times. Let's go out here and let's you know, see. There's going to be times, and this is a good quality image, so it's a bad example, but... There's going to be times where you're going to get a lot of junk and noise and things and it will ignore that. You can filter out that noise. I'm going to use the default filter because I'm a default guy. I have used this software for years and I very, very rarely shy away from the or go away from the default corner fit or the default noise because it does well. What is the default corner fit if we know what the noise is now? The corner fit, when it draws these lines on the inside and outside corners, do we want a loose fit or a tight fit? Now, if I'm too tight, then when it draws the lines, they're going to be very rigid. Very rigid lines. Okay? Very just straight, rigid, no real contours to them. 
if I back off and undo that, if I back off on the corner fit, you know, real loose, then they're going to be more curvy. Uh, they're going to be more, you know, loose and, 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 you know, sometimes it's a little sloppy, you know, depending on what it is. You know, they're going to be more loose versus pointy and stuff, rigid. So we don't want to be too, too loose. We don't want to be too tight on sometimes, but there's, there's, a, there's a purpose for having these variables. You know, there's going to be times where we need to get really rigid, straight lines, especially if we're working with block text in a picture or something. But for me, the default corner fit is an ideal corner fit uh, when drawing those lines that gives me a nice contour, kind of the best of both worlds and everything. Now once those lines are traced, we would come down after hitting preview and they're traced, we would click on apply to lock them in. And we would click on close to close the tool. Now once that image is traced, we no longer need the photograph that we used to trace the image. When the software, when we imported the image into the software, it created a bitmap layer for me. That little light bulb right there allows me to turn off the visibility of that later to hide that image. I no longer need it. So now, once my design is done, this is now a scalable graphic. I can scale it down to the size of a stamp. I can blow it up to the side of a building and it's gonna maintain its resolution. It's now a vector object, okay? Now, notice that the vector object is all solid pink. All of these individual items and vectors, they're all grouped together as one. If I need to edit or manipulate anything in this group, then I need to ungroup it. Now, over here, we are now, if we're talking about grouping and ungrouping, we are editing the object. So group is on the first row of icons, the fourth icon, and ungroup is right next to it, the fifth icon. Now, if you're using keyboard shortcuts, it's very simply the G key for group, the U key for ungroup. Ungroup, U, G group. Or we can use the buttons over here. Ungroup, group. Okay? So if we ever have to, let's say that we wanted to, you know, manipulate this or change this in some way and we needed to, you know, uh, change something, click in white space to deselect everything. And now I can come over here and I can delete and select and delete, you know, some individual noise and junk that might have occurred. Like all of these little rectangles that you see here, that's all noise and junk. I can select them and delete it. Now that this object is all ungrouped, I can come in here and edit this and things and so I got a little bit of uh, you know noise around the edges now once I'm done editing an object because there are a lot of vectors okay there are a lot of vectors here and if I you know let's say if I select this and I, I, I you know I start moving it and it's like oh geez I moved that one you know now I gotta hit undo to get back to it uh, or right click and click undo control Z is the shortcut code uh, control Y is your shortcut for redo but you know so what I want to do is after I'm done editing this object and that'll be good for now I got one more over here I'm just clicking on make sure your mouse when you're clicking on something make sure the point of your mouse is on the line if you're clicking in the middle here it's not gonna select that object if your your mouse has to be on the line to select it or you can hold down your left mouse button and call what draw what's a selection window and you can you know uh, select around it to select it now when it comes to that selection window let's say that I wanted to uh, grab these three items here okay I could select it by left clicking on one, holding my shift key down and select the other two items. When you're selecting multiple items, look at smiling at you guys. Uh, when you're selecting more than one item, it's uh, you hold your shift key. But I could also use my selection window. Now if I draw that window from left to right, 
anything that is 100% within that window. Notice I crossed over all these other lines and stuff, but they're not 100% in that selection window, so it's not going to select them. It's only going to select the items that are 100% in that window if I draw my selection window from left to right. Okay? Now, if I draw my selection window from right to left, anything that that box touches is getting selected. When I draw from right to left, any line that that box touches is getting selected. Okay? So it doesn't have to be 100% in. So just remember the direction when you're trying to select something and it's in a tight spot and you know you got a whole bunch of other stuff around it's like damn how do I get around there you know I don't really want to click on it I want to draw a box just it, it doesn't matter that you're crossing over other lines as long as uh, the objects that you're selecting are 100% in it it's all it's going to select okay now when I'm done editing an object I tend to come back and select that object and group it back together that way it's a one click everything is one now it all moves as one I don't have to worry about you know accidentally forgetting something behind you know as I'm dragging it around any of that stuff now let's say that this was the design I wanted to carve well and let's say that I'm done with my design when you're finished with designing now you move over to the toolpath software so that's this icon up here so when we switch from the drawing side of the software to the toolpath side, we're going to close this here and go back to our toolpath operations. I want to do a V-carve with this. So I'm going to select on the V-carve toolpath. Now I don't want a flat depth. Actually, I do want a flat depth because i got a lot of wide spaces. My V-carve toolpath is automatically going to calculate the depth of cut based on how wide the space between the space of two lines, how wide it needs to cut for those two lines to meet at a V shape at the bottom of that cut. Well, if I set a flat depth, it's going to truncate and cut off that V, and then it's going to cut it to the depth that I specify. And I want a depth of an eighth of an inch. Because I have a wide space between these lines, I don't want that deep V cut. So if I come in here and I calculate this toolpath, with just my V bit and a flat depth, I can calculate that. And as it calculates, it'll bring me into my 3D view and I'm gonna reset. Here's your buttons, guys and girls. Over here, all these gray buttons. Reset the preview means it's gonna put it back to a blank board. Preview the selected toolpath means it's highlighted. It's the selected toolpath, okay? Preview all toolpaths is going to show me every toolpath that's in my toolpath list. Preview the visible toolpath means that it is checked off and I can visibly see the red and blue lines over here. There's a check mark in. So if I preview the visible toolpath, it's going to carve that part. And it's just a it's an awesome part it looks really nice and uh, wooden stuff uh, just I don't know it's something as decorative it's like a tabletop or something I'm trying to think of what I want to do with it but it's really cool looking um, now when we're previewing a toolpath we can add color to it we can make that toolpath look like anything we want maybe I want to make it look like a piece of walnut Ooh, it looks good dark maybe if I was going to V-carve inlay this, which would be an awesome kind of project to tackle, It'd be a hard one, but it would be an awesome one. Maybe that inlay is going to be maple. So I'm going to I want to see what this would look like and I'm going to I'm going to give it some color, something that looks like maple. So let's go into more colors here and let's pick a color that let's go into custom and let's cover ourselves something that's got a little bit of a tannish. Where's my tans at? I don't know what maple looks like. I'm just kidding. I'm trying to find something that. Let's pull that right about there. Something like that. So I'm going to click OK. And not the best in the world as far as color. Let's give it a better color. Let's go into maroon. You know? 
That's what it looked like if I painted it. It what that's not what it would look like if I inlaid it because it would actually be all solid. But you know, uh, you can kind of be imaginative. But uh, now, look at this toolpath preview. You see all those tool marks there. Well, what that is, is I chose a V-bit to V-carve this. So it's showing the V-bit trying to flatten out all of that area, that wide area here. Well, let's go back and examine that toolpath for a minute. I chose a flat depth. Now watch right about here. You see that grayed out used flat area clearance tool? When I put that flat depth in there, now it becomes active. And now I have the option to use a flat area clearance tool, a flat router bit that I can come in and choose a router bit. So I'm gonna choose an eighth inch end mill because it's small and it'll get in those areas pretty good. And now if I wanna come in here and name this, if I wanna come in here and name this, so that way when I calculate it has a name for it, when I save it, it has a name. I'm gonna name this as 01. Uh, my board was, I think it was 19, right? We'll call it 19 by 7.25 by 0.75 V carve. And it was a 60 DEG V bit that I cut it with. Okay, so this is going to be the first tool path I'm running on this 19 by 7 and a quarter by 3 quarter inch board. It's going to be my V carve, and I'm using a 60 degree V bit. If I calculate that, now let's examine the tool pass for a minute. So notice, let me delete the profile because that's an old one. That was that rectangle. Let's delete that out of there. Notice when I calculated that tool path, now it created two duplicates. Well, they're not quite duplicate. Up to a certain point they are. But then at the very end of one, you see the word pocket. That is the toolpath that was created for my eighth inch end mill. That's going to be doing all the pocketing. Okay, let's turn off the checks on the V carve. So all the pocket cuts. And notice that my eighth inch end mill is big, so it's, it's only going to be able to pocket right here and here. It's not going to be able to flatten all that stuff out. It's going to be able to do a good job in there and all. Uh, you know, I might want to use a 16th inch end mill. So heck, why not? Let's go in here and double click on this and open the toolpath back up and hit select. And I'm gonna choose my 16th inch end mill. And yes, they do make them 16th. They actually make them down to a 64th if you look hard enough. They've got them. Um, a 32nd, 64th. Uh, so now I've got a 16th end mill. Let's calculate this. Now, let me turn off the V-carve toolpath by unchecking it. Now, notice that my 16th inch end mill can get into more of that spot and everything and really kind of clean it up. So, that's the pocket toolpath with that 16th inch end mill. Now, that V-carve, V-bit, that's just my V-bit. So, there's two toolpaths that I'm going to be running to carve this design. Now, what I tend to do, because this is a pocket, I'm going to click on here and I'm going to rename, right click on it and rename this. And I'm going to change that 60 degree V bit to my 0 0.0625 end mill. That's my router bit. So I've got my end mill and I've got my V bit. And you don't have to name your toolpath. You can, it'll create defaults VCARV 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. But it's nice to give them a name, whether it's a single name like text, outline, border, whatever the case may be. You know, uh, you just give them a name so you know what they are. So now let's preview these two tool paths. And you'll see where those tool marks were once was. You'll see now that 16th inch end mill was able to come in and flatten those areas out. Of course, where it couldn't fit, the V bit took over and, you know, flattened those areas. And this is an exaggeration, those tool marks. The V-Bit actually does a pretty decent job at flattening the area out, uh, but the software is showing us where those tool marks are for that V-Bit. Okay? Now, 
Let's go back over to the drawing side. Let's, you know, we, we jumped over to the tool path, but let's talk about the drawing side and everything. So now we imported that picture for tracing. We traced it. We created a tool path on it. Let's talk about some of these other buttons. If I need to go back and change my job size, maybe I don't want this on a, you know, 16 by seven and a quarter, maybe I are 20 by eight and a quarter. Maybe I want this on a 20 by 20. I want to make it nice and big. You know, I come in and change that. That's this icon, click OK. That's this icon right here under the file operations, set job dimension origin. And like a Word document, I've got cut, copy, paste, undo, and redo. I also have undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, and delete here by right clicking on my screen. I also have it up here in the edit menu. Undo, redo, cut, copy, paste, okay? Now again, this is a vector, so I'm going to scale this up. Now I'm gonna select this item. I'm gonna double click on it. When we do that, that brings it into transform mode. If I hold down my shift key, meaning I wanna keep it centered, but I wanna scale it as I hold my shift key down, it'll stay centered as I scale it up by grabbing one of those corner white boxes right here. So transform mode, we haven't gotten down to the transform objects menu, so rem remind me transform mode when I come back. But let's kind of talk about the creating vectors. Now we just created vectors by tracing an image, but I'm gonna add a new layer here and turn that image off. But we can absolutely create vectors by drawing our own shapes. Circles, ellipses, rectangles, polygons, a minimum of three-sided polygons, triangle, up to as many sides as you want or desire. Drawing a star or starburst, minimum of three sides up to as many sides as you want. You know, for our little starburst. You got your draw line tool, your draw arc tool, your draw curve. We can do some very cool vector texturing, uh, you know, with it. And, you know, so the with the vector texturing uh, you can create some really neat patterns all of our text tools drawing text drawing text within a vector box editing that text spacing between the letters or the lines and the curve converting the curves wrapping along a curve it's like oh my gosh how many things can you do with curves well don't let this one convert to curves confuse you okay a vector object has nodes okay a vector object has nodes nodes that we can manipulate a text object does not have nodes and though that vector object is also referred to as a curved object and so if I want to convert my text object to a curved object that has nodes like these little black points on this T, then that's that tool there. It has nothing to do with making it look like an arc or a circle or anything like that. It's converting the solid text object to a curved object so I can manipulate the text. And we're going to do that in a minute. Now, let's talk about our draw text tools here. So your regular draw text just opens up a text box. And I'm gonna write out some text. So, a little inspirational message for you guys and girls. Don't worry, be happy. All right, now I've just wrote three lines of text in the same text block. Keep that in mind, okay? So now any font that's installed on my computer, I can use. I can go online to very cool uh, websites like defont.com, defont.com. Let me get my, I'm trying to get my tab to swing over. You got to see that motion. There we go. www.dafont.com 
thefont.com. It's a very cool website where you can find thousands of fonts to use for both personal and commercial use free, free keyword. So let's say I want a script font and I want to see various samples of that script font. I can come over here and if I'm typing a particular words, let's say I'm typing, uh, you know, don't worry. I can come over here and select on more options and say I want to see only the 100% free for personal and non-commercial use, that public domain. Okay. I hit submit. It's only going to show me those fonts that are 100% free. I can download any one of those fonts. When I download them and install them on my computer, the software will then recognize. So let's pick a font, any font. I kind of like. I've got the Magnolia script. All right, I kind of like this one. I already got that one. That's why I like it. I kind of like this one too. I got that one too. Blend a script is a really nice script. Man, I got all these scripts. Hold on. I've got thousands of fonts. So let's find something a little different. Let's go into the medieval gothic fonts. No. Uh, wait, hold on a second. Uh, don't worry. Be happy is not medieval. So let's go with something groovy. Groovy. There we go. <laughs> Heavy heap. Right? Heavy heap. That looks like a don't worry, be happy sign all day long. So I'm going to download that. I'm going to click on download. Wayne, I'm going to get to that in just a moment for you about the uh, says the bit won't fit. Because that's the software's intuitiveness. Now once that heavy heap is downloaded in my Google, it downloads on the bottom left corner. If I double click to open that up, it is in a zip file. So it needs to be extracted. We're going to extract all of the files in that zip file. It's going to say, hey, select the destination. I just have it zip, unzip, should I say, to my downloads folder, and I click extract. Once it finishes extracting, it's going to open up the extracted files. On the true type font file, the TTF, I'm going to right click. Wait for it. Wait for it. My right click is uh, fidgety. I got to be careful when I right click. It likes to lock up. And I'm going to click install. It's going to install that font. Okay. Now I can close all of the windows that I had open. And if I go in. I need what I need to do is I got to close this window here so I can use that font. So I'm going to copy that so I don't have to rewrite it. And I'm going to close that text box. I'm going to come back and reopen it. Now I'm going to hit paste and I'm going to come in here and choose the heavy heap, I think it was called. So we're it's all I'm going to hit the letter H on my keyboard to skip ahead and we're going to go down to heavy heap right here. And I want this text to be, oh, let's go an inch and a quarter tall. I want it, uh, it's already kind of bold, so I'm not going to select on bold. I want it to kind of be anchored around the X, Y, zero position, which is, you know, here in the middle of my board. I'm going to click apply. So inch and a quarter is still a little small. I'm going to scale it up in things. But in the meantime, while I got the text box open, I might as well kind of do it here. I'm going to go one and three quarters. Let's see if that makes it too big. Nah, that's good. All right. Don't worry, be happy. All right. Now, I'm going to close this tool. I've got my text here, right? It's all one group because I created one text box. But I want don't worry up here. I want it a little bit bigger by itself. I want be happy right underneath that. And then I want it CNC carving time, you know, maybe a little crazy or something. So I want to, I, I can't edit this text as it's in a text block. So I want to select it. And I want to right click on it and I want to break that text block into lines. Now each one of these text lines are individual. So now I can come in and double click and let's talk about transform mode while we're here since we're at this part now. 
When I double click on an object, it brings it into transform mode. Now our transform objects menu is moving something, an object, sizing it, rotating it, mirror or copying it, distorting it, or aligning it. Well, when I'm in transform mode, in these boxes around, my middle area here is the move. My white boxes around the design are my scale or my size. Now, if I if I use the corner white boxes, it keeps the aspect ratio. If I use the middle white boxes on the edges and everything, it stretches. Okay. Now, the blue boxes on the outside here, those are rotate. Did y'all get dizzy on that red? Go around. One more time. All right. Rotate. All right. I'm going to rotate a little angle there. Now, don't worry. Be happy. We're going to drag this up. Now, also, instead of dragging, we can use the arrow keys on our keyboard. One, two, three, four, five, you know, six, whatever. I'm, you know, I can move it around with my arrow keys. I don't know why I was counting, but <laughs> I do that sometimes. All right, so I'm going to scale this up a little bit. Now, notice how I'm scaling, and I grab that corner box there, and it's pulling it to the right, right? Well, what if I wanted it right where it's at, but I wanted it a little bit bigger? Well, while I'm grabbing that corner box, hold that shift key, and it'll keep it centered on itself. Okay? If I held the control key down while I was in transform mode, and I grabbed my left mouse button, and I dragged this, I'm actually dragging a copy. I'm making a copy. And not the function key, the control key. <laughs> All right, I'm making a copy. So, you know, um, where this comes in handy is, let's say, for instance, I'm making a bullseye. Don't know why I'd make a bullseye, but let's say I'm drawing a dartboard or something. Got my bullseye here, so now i got to create my rings. If I double-click this and put it on transform mode, if I hold my shift key and drag this, well, all I'm doing is dragging that vector, that object, bigger, right? Well, if I hold my control key, we already said that it's kind of creating a copy, right? But now if I'm just holding my control key, it's, it's pulling in the direction that, that on that arrow that I'm pulling, and I don't want that. So if I double-click on this in transform mode and I grab that corner arrow and hold my shift and control key, now when I'm sizing it, it's sizing it off its center. So I'm going to grab that one, that one, that one, and I'm making a copy and keeping it centered on itself. Okay, so Control and Shift while I'm dragging in transform mode. That's one of those things that makes you look dizzy, Ooh, especially if I were to take all of this and double click on it and do something like that. All right, so don't worry, be happy. I'm not just saying that, that's what the sign says, I'm just reading it. All right, so let's go ahead and let's select on, don't worry, let's get it up here a little bit. Be happy, I'm gonna go right about here. Now, it's CNC carving time. Well, I want this, I wanna kinda go a little bit crazy, right? But I wanna go even more crazy than that. I wanna distort this in some way. I want it to be just kind of wild and wacky looking. Well, as part of that transform objects menu, we have the distort tool. Now with the distort tool, I can distort an object within a bounding box. I can distort it and have it curve to a line or in between two curves, all of that wonderful stuff. So what I want to do is I want to create some funky curves. So I'm going to grab my curve tool here and I'm just going to pull out a small line and as you go up it starts to kind of shape the curve. Space bar to finish it off. Now I'm going to take and I'm going to grab that curve 
I'm going to double click and I'm going to hold down my control key and I'm going to pull up a copy of that curve. Now I have two lines here. And I want, I'm going to rotate this one a little bit. I want to kind of go out here a little bit. I want it to kind of get wider as it goes. Now even more so than that, as I'm turning this, it's turning and making this skinnier. So I want to just, I just want to move this one up a little bit more without messing with this back end. So I'm going to go into the node editing. I'm editing the object now. Go into node editing and I want to grab this uh, one, two, three nodes right there. I want to grab a selection window around those three. And I'm going to use my up arrow key and I'm going to pull them up a little bit. Pull them in with the left arrow key. Now, on this part of the curve here, while I'm in node editing mode, I'm going to grab this one and bring this curve down a little bit. So I'm going to grab this node here, and I'm going to pull the curve down just a little bit. You know? All right. So we got this. It's not the best looking funky curve in the world, but you're going to get the idea. So now if I go into that distort mode, not, not the group mode, if I go into the distort tool and I select my text, you're going to see a green check mark saying, hey, the selected vector is valid. Good, good, good going. It's ready to go. Now, if I select on my, the line selection is very important here. If I select on my bottom line first and then my top line, it's going to distort it correctly. If I were to select on the bottom line or the top line first, then the bottom line, then it would distort it upside down. So the vector selection is very important here. So I'm going to select on that bottom line, then the top line. And now you're going to see that uh, as I go in through, if I select on between two curves, we're going to get the top edge curve is okay, the bottom edge of the curve is okay. All systems go. You are five by five. Hit it. Apply. Right? So it's going to distort that text. All right? Now, the transform object, the edit envelope, you know, however you want to do it. Uh, you can bake the distortion into one item. I usually do edit envelope, and uh, we'll talk about more of those in a moment. But now, I don't need these two curves anymore. I've already distorted the text to those two curves. But watch this coolness, okay? Because it is distorted and because it is a, it's no longer a text object, okay? It's no longer text, so make sure you got your spelling right. Make sure you got all of that stuff. But now if I go into the node edit mode, the nodes are going to basically be in the same shape as my curves, right? So I can come in here and say, okay, I want to pull this node down a little bit. I want to take and I want to squeeze these two nodes, this one and this one. I want to use my up arrow and I want to squeeze them in a bit. You see how it squeezes those letters? You know, I can make them bigger. I can make them wider. I can distort them any way I want. You know, I'll, go, I'll go deeper. I can come in and I'm going to grab these nodes over here and say I want those to kind of, I want to pinch this even more. Or it's pinched too much. I don't want it to be pinched that much. I want to kind of pull them up a little bit. You know, maybe distort them this way or that way you see the the text or the object it's no longer text is kind of distorting with that curve now so we're distorting an item and when I can I can manipulate that let's say that in the center I want it very fat you know or something and let me here's a classic here's a classic example all right I'm gonna draw a triangle I'm gonna draw a triangle okay I'm gonna use the polygon tool three-sided polygon and I'm gonna come over here and I'm gonna draw a triangle now on that triangle I'm going to uh, rotate it 90 degrees so I'm gonna rotate it using the rotate tool this time I could rotate it like this if I want but I want to use the rotate tool because I want to rotate on the center and I just want to type in the number 90 and now I can click apply and rotate it 90 degrees now, if I take that triangle, I'm going to stretch it out a little bit more. Okay. I'm going to take that triangle and I'm going to offset it. 
Oh, I'm going to offset it outward. Offset, I'm going to make a duplicate outward. Uh, a sixteenth of an inch. And I want sharp corners. And click offset. Actually, I want to undo that. I'm going to go an eighth of an inch. I want a little bit wider. 0.125. Okay. Now, I'm going to take it. I'm going to draw a circle. I'm going to snap. That's what these snapping tools are for up here. I'm going to snap to the end of that triangle, and I'm going to draw a circle, the center of my circle right on there. Okay. I'm going to take this rectangle and select it. I'm going to take this circle and I'm going to weld those two parts together with the weld tool under edit objects. Alright. Now on this inside vector right here, I'm going to come in and I'm going to go into node editing mode and I'm going to cut these lines and separate them. I'm going to cut that line there. I'm going to cut that right click and cut that node there and I'm going to right click and I'm going to cut that node there. Okay, and let's open so let's create some text and let's say let's say I I like the football team or whatever team that is called the Panthers. I don't know if there's a team out there called the Panthers, but let's say I do. All right, and I'm going to choose a different font this time. Let's go with something uh, a little blocky, little uh. Fustain. We'll go with a gothic heavy. And I'm going to go, oh, half inch tall. I'm going to grab that text and drag it into the middle here. Now, I'm making, if you guys don't know, one of those uh, bullhorn type uh, pendants, panners, whatever you want to call them. Now, if I take my text and I distort it, and I grab this line, not that line, that's, grab the bottom line first or it's going to be upside down. I grab this line and this line. I can distort that text between those two lines. Okay, and click apply. But notice that my apply button's not working. Why isn't it working? Because the two lines are touching each other right here. We need a little bit of space. So let's space it out a little bit. Let's take and bump that one up a little bit. Let's bump that one down a little bit. And let's try it again. One, hold down the shift key, select on the bottom, the top, and open up the distort tool. Between two curves, now we got everything systems go. Click apply, it's gonna distort that. Panthers, right? Now, all right, I'm gonna close that tool. I wanna take, and I don't want it to be so, I don't wanna take it up the whole corner and all here, but if I come in here, and I go into that node editing mode. Now I can come in and I'm going to bring this down a little bit. I'm going to bring this up a little bit. I'm going to select both of these nodes here and use my left arrow key. And I'm going to bring them in just a little bit. All right. Now over here on these two nodes, I'm going to select those two nodes. And I'm going to use my right arrow key. And I'm going to bring those in a little bit. All right. And then I'm going to take... Let's go into, uh, let's select our Panthers here. Let's make our P a little bit more visible. So let's zoom in. We're going to grab this node. I'm going to use my up arrow key and I'm going to make it a little taller there. Grab my down key, make it a little taller there. You know. All right, so now we got this cool Panthers, right? So now I want to V carve this. So I got to put these lines back together, right? I got I to gotta put them back together. So I'm going to click on this line. And I'm going to bump it down the way I bumped it up. I'm going to click on this line. I'm going to bump it up the way I bumped it down. Okay. And notice I've got some overlaps here right there. That's good. Right. Notice I got some overlap here. That's good. Right. Well, let's go into our scissor tool, trim tool. We're editing the object again. We're trimming this time. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to zoom in really tight and I'm going to trim that line away. Bring that back to that. I'm going to come up here really tight and I'm going to trim that line away. Now I just joined those three lines except for down here at this end. If I zoom in, I need to trim away that line and that line. Now this is once again a closed vector. So now I can come in and if I was V carving this, 
Go over to my V Carve Tool Path. Where's my V Carve Tool Path? Hold on a second. V Carve, there we go. My V Carve Tool Path over here, and I'll open this. Let's zoom this out so you can see a little better. And I want to V Carve it, uh, no flat depth on it. I'm just going to go full on, and I'm going to calculate. Preview that selected tool path. And I've got this cool little pendant banner, whatever you want to call it. You know, maybe I put another circle in the middle of that big one so it creates a little uh, divot. You know, so let's let's take and draw a circle. Now the cool thing about the snapping tools with my circle tool, if I come into the middle of this circle, I got a snap point right in the middle, and so I can draw a little circle right there. And if I open up that V-carve toolpath that I just created and I add that circle to it and recalculate it, and we reset that preview and preview that selected toolpath, now we got this, you know, pendant, flag, whatever you want to call it, but that we've distorted that text, you know. Go Panthers, right? Whatever. You guys get that? All right. So distorting is fun sometimes. All right, so let's get back to our don't worry, be happy sign. All right, so I've got this funky curve going on here, so I want to move this up, you know. I want to size it down a little bit. If I double click on it, it transform mode, I want to kind of just kind of stretch it in just a little. And I want to make sure, I want to be, you know, about here, but I want to make sure that I'm centered on my board. I don't want to be off to the left like I am. So I'm going to use the alignment tool. Now the alignment tool gives me options. I can align to my material or I can align to a selection, mean another object. And so if I align to my material, I want to align from left to right. I want it to be centered from left to right. So that's this first icon here. All right. So now I'm center. Now, I don't want it to quite be that close to the Y, so I'm going to rotate it just a little bit. All right, that'll look good. Now, let's talk about the alignment tool a little bit more in detail. So let's say that I have, you know, a circle. Let's say that I have a rectangle and let's say that I want to align that circle into the center of that rectangle then if I open my alignment tool I would select the circle first that's what I want to align I would select the rectangle last because that's what I want to align to that's the selection and I can come over here and I can center it in that circle maybe I want to be on the inside edge or the outside edge maybe I want to be on the very outside edge you know but I want to be in the center. Now, let's take that circle, hold down our control key, and let's drag off a couple copies of it. I'm just dragging them willy-nilly all random crazy and everything. And let's say that I want these three circles not only centered in this rectangle, but aligned and spaced evenly. Well, I would select them first, and then that, that rectangle last, and open up that alignment tool. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to center them. Whoa. What opened up on me? There we go. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to center them to that rectangle. They're all stacked on top of each other right now. And then inside the last vector, I want to space that selection inside the last vector either horizontally or vertically. And I want to space vertically. And it will space them equidistant from one another inside that last vector. So the alignment tool is awesome. Now let's say if I have all of these selected and I want them to be in the center of my board, then I would come up here and align to the center. You know, whatever the case may be. All right. So use your tools and know your tools. Um, very, very cool stuff in here. Now we haven't talked about mirroring, you know, and all that stuff. We'll talk about mirroring here in a second. Now, let's say that we have the don't worry, be happy sign. 
well we need some kind of we need some kind of goofiness going on right here in this dead open space or something you know or this is you know or somewhere down here in this open space so let's go up to Google Google's our best friend when we're searching for images and we're running along guys but I want I'm just trying to give you some insights to all of this stuff and we're gonna search in Google we're gonna search for uh, uh, goofy face vector who knows what we'll get goofy face vector <laughs> all right we're gonna click on images we actually got goofy in there that was pretty funny um, on the tools we're gonna say hey Google show us only images that are larger than 800 by 600 pixels because I want a nice good quality image to trace you know I'm even gonna say hey Google show me on the type of image show me only line drawings you know and if I look at my line drawings and there's not something that I don't like you know I won't use but I'm gonna go ahead and grab this guy. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna right click. I'm gonna save that image as. All right, I'm gonna save that image uh, as. Uh, let's go into. All right, hold on a second, you guys. You're getting. Uh, Get, hold on. We lost video. Y'all lost video. Did everybody lose video? Did we all lose video? Did we all lose video? Are we back yet? Are we back? Are we back? Stand by. Let's let's wait to see what we. Mm -hmm. Sound only. Sound only. Let's take a look and see what we're at. Uh, sound only. Let's take a look and see where we're at. Uh, stand by. <laughs> Everything's okay with the stream. Someone's Peter Hearn. Peter, are you calling me? When I did the circles, let's close this. When I created the circles, you're talking about all the way back to the bullseyes? Way back to the bullseyes an hour ago? Holy jamoly. Did y'all miss... That was an hour ago. Did you miss the pendant drawing and everything? <laughs> All right, let's see what we got here. Okay, you should have screen coming back in a moment. You should have screen coming back in a moment. Oh, man. Um, okay. All right. You should have screen coming back in a moment. Okay. 15 minutes of black holy cow all right that's why I love the undo button all right let's go to the undo button let's see what we can let's see how far back we can go <laughs> 15 minutes of black. I, I wasn't looking over in the comment section so I apologize I was uh, all right so let's hit the back button undo 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 was it these three circles or was it the bullseyes like way back, way back? 
Like, was it the bullseye? Was it these three circles when we were doing aligning the circles in the rectangle? Let me know if it was these three circles when we drew these circles. Okay, so we did see, you guys did see the Panthers banner. You did see the Panthers banner. All right, well, I can handle that. I can handle that. I would have went all the way back, but okay. So now before I went black, did I at least have the three circles drawn? And I was saying, okay, if I wanted to align these in this rectangle, blah, 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 right? Yes, these. Okay. All right. Sorry about that. So what I was saying was, I, I have three circles here. If I wanted these three circles to be centered, not only centered in this rectangle, but spaced evenly, then I would select those three circles first hold down my shift key and select that rectangle last go into the alignment tool I would center those circles they're all stacked on top of one another right now and inside that last vector I want to space the selection horizontally or vertically in this case vertically so when I click that it will space them equally equidistant from one another now let's say that I wanted all of those objects centered on my board, then aligning to my material, I can click on that center button and align it to the center. All right. All right. Now, after that, we started talking about I needed something goofy here, something kind of little goofy in this blank space for this don't worry, be happy sign. So I went to Google, my bestest friend, Google. And on Google, let's make sure that we're not blank screening it. On Google, I typed in Goofy Face, right, Vector. Now, in Google, I'm going to click on Images. And I'm going to say, using the Google tools, I'm going to say, hey, Google, show me only images that are 600 by 800, 800 by 600, you know, larger than 800 by 600. It's going to filter out all those images and show me something larger than 800 by 600. You know, I can use any of these images that I'd like to. You know, as far as you know, they're 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 all traceable, but I can also say, "Hey Google, on the type, show me only line drawings." You know, so now I get line drawings and everything. These black and white images, which you know I can use. <laughs> and uh, let's see here. Let's find something. I really like this guy, but I think he's a WEP file. So um, let's right click and save image as. Yeah, he's a he's a web picture. So we won't we can't use that one. Let's go over here. Let's find this guy. He's blurry. All right, bear with me. My line drawings are failing me now. Ah, oh, this dude looks like a Cheech and Chung kind of guy. Ah, oh, he's blurry too. Dadgummit. That's fine. We want a nice, clean picture. Let's go back up to the type. Instead of the line drawings, let's go to the any type here. And let's see what we've got. yeah all right so I'm gonna save right click and save that image and I'm gonna save that to my uh, downloads folder here is goofy 
And now if I go back into my Vectric software here, I can go ahead and close my alignment tool, go back into that import bitmap for tracing tool, go into my downloads, downloads. You ought to heard guys, did you hear all those beep 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 and my phone ringing? Y'all were calling me like crazy. Thank you for that. I was wondering, I thought there was some kind of fire behind me. I didn't know what was going on. Uh, but uh, I appreciate it. Sorry we went, we went behind. So I'm gonna open this image up. Now, layers is a wonderful thing to kind of make things less complicated for us. I'm gonna create, all right, actually I have a new layer created. I'm gonna create a new layer and I'm gonna call this my goofy face layer. And I'm gonna turn off layer two to hide my text and all that stuff for right now. Now when I trace this image, everything that's going to get drawn is going to get drawn in that goofy face layer because it's highlighted and it's active. It's my active layer. So let's zoom in here and let's open up the trace bitmap tool. Let's uh, scale down some of those colors. Notice that screen, by the way, notice that screen blinking in the background. My henna picture is still in there, right? My henna picture is still in there. So if we, if we were to move this image for a minute let's close this tool for a second and move this image I don't need that hint in there I'm gonna delete it out of there that's what was blinking up behind the image now of course it would have nothing to do with the tracing uh, or anything it would just uh, you know interfere so it just it just keeps blinking like that so I'm gonna convert this to a black and white image Notice that image was watermarked and the watermarks uh, converted that image to a black and white. But notice as I slide more, can bring that image back. Let's turn the fading off so you can see it in its full glory. You know, so that's where the watermarks were. So I'm gonna slide this bar, the black and white tracing to right about there. Default corner fit, default noise, preview to trace the lines, click apply to apply the lines and close to close the tool, rinse and repeat. I'm gonna come in here and I'm gonna turn that bitmap layer light bulb off to hide that bitmap layer and now I've got my little goofy tracing here. And they're all grouped together so I'm gonna ungroup those so that way I can come in here and I can delete the stuff that I don't want. Now, this <clears throat> image here Notice how it said what I just laid, no free use allowed. You know, you want to respect that. You know, it's only a couple of bucks, a couple of pennies or what have you. Uh, go to that, you know, that stock website and, uh, you know, if you want to sell, buy the image so you can trace it and stuff. All right. You know, you know, fair is fair. All right. So I'm going to take this and I'm going to regroup it back together. Now I'm, I'm using this for a tutorial. I'm not going to be carving this or selling my projects with it or anything like that. It's just a tutorial training. So free usage permitted all right we're gonna group that back together now I'm gonna size this down a little bit and I'm gonna turn my layer 2 back on my text and everything now I can come in here and uh, let's move this around and let's see how I want to position everything so I'm gonna put this up here a little bit more this guy up here a little bit more. I'm going to bring this down a little bit more. And this guy, I'll make him a little bit bigger. Not much. Move him over there. And what the heck, let's use the mirror tool for the first time. On the mirroring tool, I want to create a mirror copy. I want to flip it about my job center and I want to flip it horizontally. You know, I don't think that would look good. But now you know how to mirror. All right, horizontally, vertically, horizontally, you know, whatever you, you know, whatever you want to do. You can either just, without creating a mirror copy, you can flip this guy, you know, left to right. Vertical, horizontal, vertical, horizontal, 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 horizontal. You know, 
Um, so we'll leave that face like that. We'll just go with that with one, 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 one face. Um, I'm going to rotate him just a little bit. And drag him right about that. All right. So we got our sign, you know, we got, we, we played around with some of the tools and things. Um, you've got your selection mode. That's what we're always doing in when we're selecting. That's our selection mode arrow. You got your node editing. That's when we're editing the lines and the curves and things like we did earlier. You've got your transform mode. You can click on this button to put something into transform mode rather than double clicking. So if I double click, it puts it in transform mode. If I click on transform mode, the object that I click on is gonna automatically gonna go in transform mode. So that's the transform mode tool. We got group and ungroup. We have a measuring tool. This is a measuring tool just like this is a measuring tool. This one adds dimensions to my drawing. Let's say I want to know how big my D is. <laughs> uh, only I would laugh at that. Okay, so I want to click from here to here and get a measurement. It's going to put a measurement on the 2D drawing just like a blueprint, right? That's the add measurement, the dimension tool right here. But now I have a measuring tool under edit objects that I can just come in here and click on, you know, from this point to this point. And it's going to tell me my distance if I click on my actual point. Am I broken up into vectors here? Grouped together? What's going on? Can it not measure on a vector? Bear with me a second. Let me test this theory out. So it's catching all the spans of the letter D and it's throwing the measurements in all the spans, right? Not the, you know, it's not showing me my measurement on my measurement between two points because all the points are real tight on this font. Bam, 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 bam. So. If I convert this font to a curve, now if I go into node editing mode, let's look at my all, all my spans. So it was catching measurements between those spans and everything. Well, hell, let's go ahead and delete some of those so I can show this tool off. Uh, we're gonna delete that point. We're gonna delete that point. We're gonna delete that point. We're going to take this line right here and we're going to just pull this anchor in and pull that line right back in in a curve, but with less nodes. Okay. Now, if I want to measure from this point to this point, don't you argue with me. I wonder why that's not. Why not? Oh, here it is. The vector number of spans. There's still spans in there. What's up with that? Oh. Oh, 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 we're getting somewhere now. Five point two six inches square. That's the area. Let's zoom in here. Let's see what's going on. We got some funkiness. Oh, I'm in the span. <laughs> I'm an idiot. All right, look what I got selected. The span part of the measure tool. I don't have the measure between two points selected. I'm sitting there going, why isn't it measuring? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. Now I can measure between two points and it's going to put the measurement up there. <laughs> I'll be damned. Okay. All right. I had the wrong thing selected. I was like, wait a minute. Why is it only showing me the spans? Okay. So my measure 4.233, right? Now, when I close that tool, that goes away. It's just like putting that tape measure back on my belt loop. Um, so, uh, yeah. How are we doing there? And I didn't have to delete those three points. To do that, I just had to be in the right tool. From this point to this point. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> That's funny. Everybody makes mistakes. All right, so we got our don't worry, be happy sign going on. Let's create a tool path. Let's see how well we did, how well of a sign we did. But first, but first, I want to create a boundary around this. 
not a rectangle. I want to snap to this corner, hold my left mouse button down. And I don't mean to be yelling in the microphone. I know it's real loud, guys. Turn your volume down because uh, that microphone is super powerful. Um, but So I don't mean to laugh and yell in your ear, but I thought that was funny because I screwed up. But I want to offset this inward. I'm going to use the offset tool. I want to offset it inward. Uh, quarter of an inch. Two million decimal points. And I want to delete the original, that original rectangle I drew, and I want to select a new one. I want I don't want sharp corners. I want to offset it inward. Uh, quarter of an inch is too small. Let's go three eighths. Let's go a half. Let's go big or go home. Half inch. Ooh, a little close there. That's fine. We'll leave that. We'll bump this guy down a little bit. We'll bump this guy down a little bit. All right. Now, I'm not going to use that border to start off with. I'm going to select all my text in my little happy face. I'm not going to select the border. And I'm going to come into my V-Carve toolpath. On my V-Carve toolpath, it's going to be a zero start depth, no flat depth. I don't want a flat depth with this. And I don't have anything really wide that's going to cut through that I'm aware of. I'll be made aware of it by the software in just a moment when I hit calculate if it's going to cut through the wood it's going to warn me look at that warning the tool will cut through the material my material is only three quarters of an inch thick my maximum tool depth is 0.843 that's how deep it wants to cut use a sacrificial layer or you'll damage your machine bed well of course we don't want to do that so we're going to hit cancel and we're going to add a flat depth and i'm going to go with a flat depth of a quarter of an inch I'm going to go 3 eighths. I want to go big. 3 eighths. 0.375. I'm going to use a flat area clearance tool of an eighth of an inch end mill just for the kicks and giggles of it. And I'm going to calculate that tool path. All right. Let's reset our preview. Let's get it back into a front on view here. And let's preview that selected tool path. Oops. Not all of them. I previewed the panther. Hold on a second. Let's preview the visible toolpath, not selected. All right, let's uh, let's change this. I like cherry. I'm a big fan of cherry on uh, you know these looks and stuff. Let's give this a little bit of a color, a little cheerful color or something. Um, let's do a toolpath color of. A global fill color of orange. You know? Alright, so we've got that sign. Nice little V carve sign. But wait, there's more, he said as he tried to sell him a rotisserie grill. I'm going to click on this rectangle and I'm going to calculate another V carve toolpath. This time I'm going to have a flat depth of 0.15, a smaller flat depth, using the same 60 degree view bit and the same eighth inch end mill. I'm going to hit calculate and it all of a sudden by putting that boundary around my design, I've created a completely different looking project. As you'll see right now. Uh, I was off on the timing on that. Right now. All right, so I'm going to reset that preview back to a blank board. I'm going to preview those visible toolpaths that I just created. And now we're going to have this funky, happy, don't worry, be happy. It's CNC carving time sign that has that raised island style effect. Uh, you know, get a nice little V carve going on there. And how awesomeness is that? So. Let's go ahead and turn the color off. Let's give it a little bit of a, what's a happy color? A happy color. I don't know, whatever a happy color is. You know, purple. Whoa! So, you know, we got this nice raised effect now. You know? And uh, let's say that I liked the way the face was carved in, right? And, and rather than being built up like this, well, let's come in here and let's put a boundary around the face. 
let's come over here and with it selected just the face selected if I come in here and offset it outward a eighth of an inch a little bit more I'm gonna go a little bit bigger offset it outward 0.2 now all I want is this outside boundary right here and I don't want all the other stuff so I'm gonna turn I'm gonna hold down my shift key I'm gonna select on this guy right here and this guy right here and I'm gonna hit delete on my keyboard to delete all of that stuff out of there now I need to combine some vectors. You guys are going to get a quick glimpse at combining vectors. I'm going to go into node editing mode and on this vector here, this one here, I want to cut that vector right about there. Looks like a good enough spot. I'm going to click on this vector here and I'm going to cut it right about there. I'm going to come all the way around here somewhere and right about there looks good to me. I'm going to cut it there and I'm going to click on this vector and I'm going to cut it right about there. All right, now I'm gonna come in and all these lines that I just cut free, I'm gonna delete that line. I'm gonna delete that line. I'm gonna select both of these lines right here. This one holding the shift key down and this one. And I'm gonna join them. I'm gonna join these vectors with either a straight line, a smooth curve, or I'm gonna bring the two open endpoints to a common point of intersection. I'm going to use a smooth curve and I'm going to click that once, twice, three times a crazy. Okay. So now I've got this boundary around the head, right? So if I go back into that toolpath and I add that boundary into the toolpath, right? Holding the shift key, let's select it all again with the boundary now and recalculate that toolpath. Stand by Alfred or Alan, uh, I'll answer that question. Reset the preview. Preview the visible tool pass. And so now we got this goofy guy. Looks much better all filled in like that, you know? So. <laughs> That's fun. All right. So Alan Feldman asks, can you make the letters round and not flat on the top? Can you make the letters round and not flat on the top? In VCarve Desktop and VCarve Pro, unfortunately, you cannot. In Aspire, you can. Okay? In the Vetric Aspire, you can. If we were to pop over to the Vetric Aspire for a quick glimpse. And here's something cool, guys. I'm going to open up my Aspire, right? Okay, I want this design over the Aspire so we can see it in, uh, you know, that 3D, you know, kind of raised letters like Alan's talking about. I'm going to select my entire design. I'm going to export it out of this program as a DXF file. We're going to call this, don't worry, be happy, DWBH. And I'm going to save that in my downloads. Now in my Vetric software, I'm going to come in. I'm going to create a new file in my Vetric software that's going to be 20 by 20. Not 2020. <laughs> I used to have 2020 eyesight. By three quarters of an inch. Oh, I did it again. 2020 by three quarters of an inch. And I'm going to click apply. Or okay, not apply. I'm going to come over here and I'm going to import a vector from a file. I'm going to go to my downloads. DWBH, DXF. All 
right? Bring that right in. Now in my modeling tools in the Aspire software, let's make this a little bit bigger. In my modeling tab of my Aspire software, I have what's called the Create Shape tool from Selected Vectors. And so if I select my vectors, my text and all, we'll do the don't worry, be happy, even the W, and it's CNC carving time, we'll grab that. I'm gonna group these guys together so I don't have to keep clicking like that. G for group, all right. Now, in the Create Shape tool, I want a curved profile. I want a nice little subtle curve, you know, uh, 60 degrees. Uh, I want it to have a base height. I'll, maybe I want my text to be a quarter of an inch tall. I actually want it to be 0.15 inches tall. No limit and click Apply adding it to, you know that add feature click apply <clears throat> and if we look at our 3d view we can see that you know quarter inch with that curve now 60 inches kind of dramatic so let's actually back that down to uh, let's go 30 and click apply again back that off a little bit create that nice little pillow top um, you know top text you know that nice little curve all right now let's say that I wanted my text to uh, almost have a round over right on the edges a nice little round over then I'm gonna go full-on 75 degrees you thought I was gonna say 90 when I said full-on didn't you I want to go with a base height of a quarter of an inch just like that um, and I want to limit let's go a quarter of an inch let's go a base height of a quarter of an inch but I want to limit that height to an eighth of an inch. Now it's going to flatten off that top. You know, it's going to limit that curve, that shape height. And so now that's going to give me that round over look. Like all my letters are rounded over. Okay. So, you know, um, in the Vetric Aspire, we can do that. In the Vetric V-Carve Desktop and Pro, we won't be able to okay so keep that in mind and now when you do create that shape that is a 3d model uh, so you do have 3d modeling carving times with that and stuff and all so uh, on this guy here you know I could I could build a model off of him that's what Aspire gives us the ability to do uh, let's let me, if you got, uh, if you guys, oh gosh, it's 10 o'clock. We can't do into that night. We could, uh, you, you want to, you want to take another five minutes to build this into a model so you see how that works in the Aspire software? Or do you guys want to call it a night? You tell me. Alan, do you have VCarve Desktop? Do you have VCarve Pro? Or do you have, uh, you know, Vetric, uh, you know, Desktop, VCarve Pro? Uh, which one of the twos do you have? Which one of the two do you have? You guys want to see how to build a model? Or do you want to call it a night? I don't think anybody else is still with me. I think everybody went to bed. All right. I'm going to start a component on this guy's head. And we're going to go into the tiled view so we can see this side by side. I'm going to zoom into his face. From the foundation, from the foundation up, Uh, let me know, Alan, what, uh, if you have De Vetric, VCar Pro, or Spottle. So, with the model and the Create Shape tool, we're going to build from the foundation up. For the foundation of this guy for being a model is going to be the outside boundary here. So I want to have a nice, I want to have this, it's going to be flat to build his face up on and everything, but I want that round over look. So I'm going to do a curved profile, and I am going to do that 75%. 75 85 90 you know my my roundovers will get tighter and tighter and tighter if i go with a 90 it's going to be a much tighter roundover so let's do a 90. um and uh v -carb desktop okay alan v -carb desktop the aspire upgrade from v -carb desktop is 1625 dollars sir 1625 um <clears throat> From there, we're going to go, I'm going to go with that base height of a quarter of an inch. I am going to limit it to the eighth of an inch so it flattens off the top but gives me that round over to edge with that 90 degree round over. 
This is going to be an add mode here, and I'm going to click apply. As I do that, it's going to build that model. Okay, that's the foundation. Now I'm going to start a new component here, and for this mouth area, for this mouth area here, this big kind of wide vector all the way around, I want to have a flat profile and I want to uh, have it taken down about 0.1 and I want to subtract that away from the model. So I'm going to click apply. Okay, I don't know what these pop-ups are here. All right, now for the tongue area here, we're gonna start a new component and for these three components, this guy, this guy, actually just the tongue to start off with. I do want a little bit of a, little bit of a curved profile on that instead of being flat. Uh, I'm going to make it a little subtle. It's going to be about a little uh, 25 degree curve profile. Uh, I want it to have that base height of 0.1 that I took the mouth down to and I want to add that back in and click apply. <laughs> Alright, I'm going to start a new component. And I'm going to grab these two guys here. These are going to be kind of more so uh, curved profiles in a sense um, they're going to be more flat so I'm going to do flat profiles for them and uh, that point one and I'm going to add it back in and click apply no nah no I want to subtract those away. I want to subtract those away and click apply. Uh, but not a flat profile, a curved profile. And I don't want, I don't want that line in the middle. So give me a second. I'm going to hit reset on that one to blank it out. And I'm going to take on these vectors here. I want to take real quick and I'm going to go into node editing. Node editing. And on this vector, this one and node editing I'm gonna cut that vector right there and on this guy I'm gonna cut that vector right there I'm gonna come over to the other side and on this corner I'm gonna cut that vector right there and on this corner I'm gonna cut that vector there that way I can delete this and that and I can join these two vectors. Let's move back over. Hold down my shift key and select those two. Hold down my shift key and select those two. Not the big model in the background. Not the big model in the background. I want to join those together. So I'm going to pop back over to my drawing tab and join them with a straight line once, twice. Now I can come back over and now I can open my create shape tool back up. I want to get rid of that center line. I want this to be domed in a little bit, no limit, subtract it away, let's see what that looks like. I'm going to give it a little bit more base height, or a little less base height actually. There we go. Back that off a little, little bit. It should be going to look like coming downhill. Back it off a little bit more. There we go. Alright. Alright, so now I'm going to start a new component. And on this uh, component here, it's going to be the outside of the eyes. The outside of the eyes. I want this. <laughs> I want this to be a curved profile, a nice 30 degree curve, a nice scoop out, no base height, zero base height. 
I want no limit. I want a nice little 30 degree scoop and I want to subtract that away and click apply. All right. Now start a new component on the inside of the eyes here. <laughs> He's going to look goofy. On the inside of the eyes here, I want that to be a flat profile. I want it to have a little bit of height, maybe a sixteenth of an inch. I want to add that back in and click apply. And on my new component, start a new component. On my pupils here, these guys, I'm going to select all of these. And these are going to kind of be like little buggy pupils and all that stuff, except for the two dots. I want to do a curve profile, little, uh, little bubbly, a little bubbly. Let's go 60 degrees, make him look like he's bulging out of his eyes. Uh, no base height. And I want to add that back in and no limit. I want to click apply. little bubbly looking thing there all right now the last components is going to be these little eyebrows here these eyebrows I want them sunk in versus built up I could build them up as well uh, probably would look better built up as eyebrows so I want to go full on full on 90 degrees no height no base height no limit apply Okay, all right, so now we're going to close off this uh, tool, and I've got all these individual components here, and just like baking a cake, I need to select all the individual components of this model, and I need to bake them those selected components into a single component. I need to bake them into one model, so I'm going to click on the bake button. You should see the souffle rise when it's ready to go. <laughs> Did you see that little whoop? All right, so the model is all, you know, almost done. Now, on the curves and contours and everything, they're really kind of rigid right now, right? So we want to smooth them out some. And I want to click, uh, and this probably would have looked better if he had bulging eyes the other way, like they were bubbling out of his head upward instead of downward, right? They would probably look good as a bubble. So I'm going to undo, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he should have bulging eyes, not sucked in. So let's undo real quick. Control Z, undo the baking. Let's click on his, not that one, that one, that one. That needs to be on the Create Shape tool. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, where is it at again? I, I hit the wrong button. On the properties of that model, the property tool, Rather than coming, uh, you know, uh, being, you know, it's like, then we're going to reverse that. No. No. No, I said. All right, we're going to undo that. And we're going to close. We're going to delete that component right there. Delete it. We're going to select on those components right there again. And we are going to go in the shape tool. We're going to go on full on. Uh, let's go with a, oh gosh, 60 degree, no base height, um, no limit, and add it in and click apply. <laughs> and the pupils, the pupils should be sunk in. Yeah, let's see. Okay, 60. Let's see what 75 looks like. 75. Let's click apply. Let's see if it gets really buggied. Oh, oh let's turn this and look at it. Uh, 75 might be a little overkill. Let's back that off to 60. Click apply. All right. Now, yeah, he looks better with bulgy eyes. Okay, now... We're going to uh, close this tool on our component that was the uh, eyes here, that component there. We're going to delete that. 
Dolete. 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 Okay. And we're going to grab our shape tool and we're going to come in here and we're going to grab all of these again. And these are going to be, uh, we'll go with a nice little 30 degree, you know, nothing major. Uh, 30, not 60, 30. 30. Um, we're going to go with a no limit, subtract, and click apply. 30 is too subtle. Let's go with a 60 and click apply. I don't know. The pupils look a little groovy, but that's okay. We're going to click close. We're going to take all those components. <laughs> I think I might have liked them better with sunken in eyes, but that's okay. We're going to take all those components. We're going to bake them back together as one. We'll see what he looks like after we smooth them out. All right. So now, like I said, all those rough edges and everything. We're going to click on the smoothing filter. We're going to apply a smoothing filter. And it's going to go through and regenerate that model. And smooth everything out. Now, I'm going to close this uh, window here and maximize. Oops, cancel. I'm going to minimize this and maximize my model view here. And let's look at this. So. I have to determine now is my smoothing going to take away to any of the detail and also if I can I can slide this back a little bit and see what it would look like if I minimize some of the smoothing you know that's a little too rough coming here I just want a nice smooth everything out nice and evenly come in a little bit more right about there and click OK to bake that in and now we have this funky looking 3D models that we just built up from scratch. <laughs> All right, so if we come into our uh, 2D view here and we take our don't worry, be happy. And we go back into the create shape tool and on all of that, don't worry, be happy. We go 75 degrees, quarter inch height, uh, limit to an eighth of an inch. So we get that round over. I'm going to go 80, uh, get a little less round over and click apply to add that in to that model. All right. So we got the don't worry, be happy in here. Now to finish it off on my rectangle here. Oops. Always, by the way, guys, always um, when you are creating a model, before you switch over to a new vector, uh, when that component is created, always click on Start New Component. Okay. Now I can select on this vector here, and this is going to be a flat profile, quarter inch thick. It's going to be an ad. We're going to click apply. We're going to build up that backer board. Now, let's take a look at this here. Okay. Let's take a look at this. So we've got this model and all. Now, I'm going to close this tool. And if I took my text... And I changed the combine mode instead of adding it to the top of that black that blank plate, and I merged it, did it, and I grabbed that component and put it at the bottom. You'll see how my text sinks in. Uh, you know, so if I take my text and I put it as an add, how it was, it's going to be sitting on top of that foundation, right? But if I merge it combine mode merge it's gonna merge with this quarter inch material that I got it's gonna kinda of sink down in on my happy face here you know on my bait component if I merge him as well he's gonna merge in also and so you know 
now we have just created a model a 3d model all right all right guys and girls listen it's 1008 let's see what kind of uh, uh, questions we got um, uh, for that price you can find someone like me to make models for you and I can send them to you as an STL that's right that is also a service that I provide to the customers and a lot of the other guys and girls that have Aspire I'm sure for a small fee you know they would uh, be willing to make models for people that's a great service to, to provide you know um, and uh, you know so you know you can find that service uh, Bob, the reason why you can't see my mouse on the screen, I'm not sure. You should be able to see my cursor unless I set it, uh, unless I set it to, uh, and I forgot to set it to show the cursor. You might, you might not be able to see it if I, if I set it to show the cursor. Um, everyone should be able to see how much the uh, split screen of the 2D and 3D helps when you're doing this. Yes. So that split screen definitely helps when you're building up models. Uh, and things you know you can see that real live action take place as you're creating those shapes and stuff you can work with those screens over and under or you know top and bottom maximize your 2d view to get out of the split screen and zoom to fit now notice like here you're saying whoa wait a minute in my 2d view where did all my text go well that component here when I created it last, it kind of covered that text up. If I come in here in my 2D view and move to back, then you would see all the text and everything. And put it to the back, you'd see all the text. All right. All right. Now, going back to the henna image, going back to the henna image, Do you have to specify where end mills need to clean image, where the V bit left scoring and all? Uh, no, it knows where the flat areas are. You don't specify it. It knows where the flat areas are. So when we're you know when we're looking at our uh, tool path on that uh, henna image, let me find my henna image here. it knows where the flat areas are for the pocket cut and it knows where the flat areas are for the you know the v-carb the pocket cut of those are the flat areas and um you know the rest of the design is the you know the v-carb so it automatically knows what's going to be the flat areas when you use a flat area clearance tool in a flat depth um don't forget how uh, to show us how to clear offsets in TNG. Yep, we're going to call this uh, night and we're going to show that last uh, step on how to clear an offset in the TNG software. Uh, hopefully this was a good lesson. Play around with your tools, guys and girls, your offset and layout tools. Uh, for you cribbage board makers out there, let me turn off and create a new layer. Add a new layer. And turn off that layer and turn off the tool pass. When you see the tool path previews, that means that your tool paths have check marks in them. Alright. Let's say that I have a oval track. Let's say I have an eighth inch circle. 0.125, not 125, 0.125 diameter, okay? And I'm making a cribbage board. Well, first off, the spacing of that circle, I'm gonna come in and draw a 1 8 inch by 1 inch, 1 8 inch wide by 1 inch wide rectangle. I'm going to take, and let's say I do a, whether a single track or a triple track or a double track, 
I'm going to come in here and I'm going to grab my control key and I'm going to bring down one, two, three copies. I'm going to select those copies there and I'm going to select the rectangle last. We saw this just a moment ago when we lost the black screen. Let me make sure we're not black screening it right now or not. Okay. Uh, if I select that rectangle last, I can go into my alignment tool and I can align to the center. Then I can space evenly, space vertically to space those out nice and even in there. Now there's 121 uh, circles or rows and things inside of a, uh, typically for a cribbage board, 120, 121. Uh, but you do have start and end areas and things like that. And every five you have a line and all. So I'm going to take and I'm going to draw a line. I'm going to snap that line to the center of the rectangle and draw it right straight down to the center there as well. I'm going to take all my little objects here that I just created and I'm going to group them together as one item. Now if I take that and I usually add a couple, I usually add an extra 20 or so uh, to the counter, maybe an extra, you know, uh, 40. But I'm going to take and I'm going to select that oval right there and I'm going to go into my array tools, offset and layout tools, my array tool of copy vectors along or copy along a vector. So the first object I copy is going to copy along the second object. So if I say that I want a hundred and oh for spacing 160 copies align the objects to the curve create the copies on a new layer click copy it's going to create those 160 for me all the way around all right now I'm going to close that tool. I'm going to come in here and all these objects that I created, they're still grouped together. Uh, so I'm going to go in and I have a start and a finish line. We're going to go here and I'm going to grab these. All oh, those look pretty good. We're going to grab those few. All oh, so few. And I'm going to uh, ungroup them. U for ungroup. And I'm going to select just on this line right here and this line right here and then I'm gonna hit my delete key and delete all that and I'm gonna come in here to my text tool and I'm gonna click on start I'll go all capital letters start and finish I'm gonna go with a uh, you know a nice looking uh, text I'll go with a monotype corsiva or something no, never mind. Monotype doesn't look good in all capital letters. So I'm going to go with a uh, Mongoli, Balti, News. I like my News font. We're going to use a News font. That's also, this News font is on uh, a, um, the font.com. And I'm going to click on, I'm going to go uh, point three quarters, point seven five. If I zoom out, that's a little bit big. So let's, let's bring it down a little bit. Point four. There we go. I'm going to break that text block into lines and I'm going to come over here and I'm going to drag this bad boy right up here and I'm going to snap to this line. I'm going to open and close my text tool and I'm going to open up my rotate tool and off of the center of that start right there, that center dot, I'm going to rotate this until I get, you know, a look that I want. Now my start's a little big, so I'm going to undo that rotate for a quick second, and I'm going to size that down. So I'm going to come down and sneak it down a little bit. Now I'm going to rotate that on its center. And I'm going to snap onto that line somewhere right about... I'm going to take my finish tool, and I'm going to go ahead there, my finish text, and I'm going to bring it down right here while I'm here. And I'm going to drag it and snap it up to the line up here. On its center, I'm going to rotate it until I get a nice little angle of what I want. And I'm going to drag it and snap it somewhere closer to that line. So my little start and finish lines. Now, every five of these groups, one, two, three, four, five, on the sixth one, I'm going to ungroup that. I'm going to deselect that line. Let's oh, close your tools. Always close your tool. I'm going to deselect that line and I'm going to hit delete. 
because we have groups of five. Now on these guys here, on these five, I'm going to select every single one of them. And I'm going to ungroup those. And now all I need to do is the rectangle and the line. Hold your shift key while you're doing this, folks. Hold your shift key. Rectangle and the line. I'm drawing from right to left. Notice that so it selects just those two items that I'm crossing over. And I'm going to hit delete. And so as you can see, if we continue this process all the way around, we are basically creating a cruise board. Once everything is all said and done, I can, because I want tracks to go in between these, I got this center track here, I want to offset this outward. But I want to know what that distance is. So if I come over here and I open up my measure tool, and I take a length measurement, from the center of this circle to the center of this circle, we've got a length of 0 0.2812. 0 .2812. All right. So half of that, if I were to offset this line, both directions, inward and outward, if I offset that 0 0.2812 divided by 2 equals 0 0.1406 and click offset, create my tracks. Now I can come in here and I can delete my center line away. I can delete my measurement away. And we've got the start of what looks to be a pretty decent looking oval shaped cribbage board that we can do some V carving in, some modeling in and all. We just have to go through and create our, you know, taxes and everything. You know, our text or whatever it is, you know, put a 3D model in there, bear claw, gator, whatever the case may be, so on and so forth. So keep that in mind when you uh, when you uh, when you're doing your, those things like that. You know, that's a quick and easy way to make sure that all those circles end up in a row, perfect straight row, aligned perfectly all the way around. A little tip and trick for you cribbage board critters out there. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to jump over to TNG. I'm going to show a quick how to click a button and change an offset, and then we're going to call it a night. I uh, hope this helped orientate you to your software a little bit. Get in it, have fun, play around. Remember, you have help tutorials. Uh, you know, you've got uh, help tutorials. You've got um, all kinds of things. Uh, not only the tutorials with us, but with Vetric. You've got the library. So even on if I come to the actual Vetric website, training materials, click on the software. And we have that library. So be sure to take advantage of that library as well. All right, let's uh, minimize this and uh, let's go into our TNG for a second, a quick moment. You're going to get a black screen while I uh, do that. All right, in our TNG software. Okay, so now I'm not connected to a machine right at the moment. Uh, so um, there are three ways uh, to change, uh, to clear out an offset. Um, three ways. One, go to the machine menu, come down to work position, work offset position, and tool offset position, and choose the option 2-0. Absolute position 2-0. Work position 2-0. Offset 2-0. Tool offset 2-0, you know? Okay. Also over here, you have a rectangle with an X with little arrows pointing like your X and Y axis and all. That is an offset clearing tool. Okay. That is the, that X clears out offsets, that button on the right. So either way that you do it, you can clear your offsets with this icon here, or you can clear all offsets, any kind of offsets and things and bring them everything back to zero, you know, as far as when you're starting fresh, you can do that in the machine menu, work position to zero, work offset to zero, tool offset to zero, absolute position to zero whatever you want to do 
Um, you can clear all that out and uh, that's how you would do that. All right. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you have a great night. I want to thank you very much for attending. And hopefully in this long, long video, you did not fall asleep and you were able to pick up some tips, tricks, information, something to get you drawing and being creative. Give me a call if you have any questions or post in the Facebook group. I always monitor that group as well. And uh, until next time, have a great night. That